Tarmac as he brings the word today. Yes, yes. This is a serious sermon. It's called Problem, Promise, and Process. Now, let's say it again. Say it with me. Problem, Problem. Promise, Promise, Process. Process. Sometimes life can just beat you down and drive you into the dust. Sometimes life just seems to get the best of us. Too much hurt, too much stress, too much pain, overload, can't cope, burnout. It just seems that there is one more problem than you can bear. And then there is what psychology calls the silent scream. That's where inside you're screaming and like the tree that falls in the forest because no one can hear it. I want to answer some questions. I have been asked several times in my life what is the best sermon I ever preached. My answer is always the same, my next one. <laughs> because I don't know that I've ever preached a good sermon. I try to preach great truths. I'm not worried about preaching a great sermon. I am interested in giving you truth because you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's not truth that sets you free. It's only the truth that you know that can set you free. So I don't worry about preaching great sermons. I try my best to preach truth that will set you free Truth that will deliver you. Truth that will give you the faith and the power to stand one more day when you're under attack. Now this sermon today, problem. I'm going to give you two verses. Psalm 34 verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. And the next verse is from Exodus 1, verse 12. And it says, The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And I'm going to put this together so you can understand. The problem. The problem in Exodus, when it says, The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The Egyptians were afraid of the Hebrew slaves. They said, what are we going to do if we get attacked from the outside and these slaves, they're getting more plentiful, they're getting stronger, and they're among us. They cook our food, they clean our houses, they work our fields, they make the bricks. They're among us. If they decided to join the enemy, they could kill us at any time. So that was the problem. So they come up with a solution. They said, what we will do, they're multiplying way too fast. They've got too much free time. What we will do, we will double their workload. We will double the pressure that they're under. If they have to make 100 bricks a day now, now they can start making 200, and they'll have to gather their own straw to go into bricks. We will give them so much to do, they won't have time to multiply. They'll be too busy trying to get some rest. You probably didn't catch that. The result of this new Egyptian policy was the strange phenomenon that takes place every time God's people come under affliction and persecution. Through the, all through the book of Acts, Every time that the church, the Christians, were preaching the gospel, the gospel was spreading, people were being saved, and they would come under persecution. And it says they went everywhere preaching the gospel, and Christianity multiplied and grew. So the result of this new Egyptian policy was 
We're going to afflict them. We're going to double their pressure, double their workload. And the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Now the process, so you have a problem. Then you have the promise. The problem is many are the afflictions of the righteous. The promise is the Lord will deliver you out of those afflictions. But there is a process that's involved. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Affliction, pressure, trials, problems can either destroy you or make you strong. No problem can break you unless you choose to let it break you. And therein is the danger. Because although God did not give the power or the authority of any problem, any pressure to break you, He has given that power to you. In a moment of fear, panic, pressure, discouragement, doubt, in that moment of self-pity, you can self-destruct. You can give up and say, what's the use? Why keep trying to live for God? I can't do it. I'll just quit. The greater the problem, the greater the recovery. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. When I got out of the United States Navy, I had a wife and a son. I had no job, no prospects. We were discharged in San Diego, California, Coronado Island. We went, this, we went to Louisiana because that's where Joe's family was. My mother was there. We had friends there. We knew people there. I began to question everybody I could talk to. Where can I find a job? I needed, I've got a family to support. I didn't go down and draw any unemployment or anything like that. I, went, I was looking for a job. And they told me they were hiring at the, at the Louisiana Ammunition Plant in Doline, Louisiana. I went immediately and applied. I filled out the application, gave it to them, and they said, it may be several weeks because we will have to run a security clearance on you. I said, I have security clearances. I don't know if it's what you're looking for or not, but I gave them a place they could check. And they checked and called me, what, three, four days later. It was pretty quick. Said, uh, you can go to work Monday if you like. I guess they accepted the security clearances that I had. I had not been working at the Louisiana Ammunition Plant for very long that they put me to inspecting cluster bombs. Now, a cluster bomb is a big bomb that has a whole bunch of little bombs, about maybe a little bit smaller than tennis balls. But they, have, they come in racks. There'll be 12, 15, 18, 21 in a rack and several racks in each one of these big bombs. And every one of those small, when the bomb, big bomb hit, it blew these bombs out all around, 100 yards. I mean, you could get blown up with one of the little ones. Powerful stuff. They put me, I guess because of the security clearances I had, they put me to inspecting these cluster bombs, every one of those little bombs placed in a rack, and they could not move. If they moved and vibrated too much, they could explode and blow up the plane and everybody else. So I had to test them, and you had to test each one. And I'll tell you, blisters formed on my hands. My thumbs were black with blisters, blood blisters. They were so sore. I had blisters on top of blisters. I didn't have gloves, but if I'd have had gloves, gloves would have had blisters. It was bad, hurt, painful. I would come home every night in pain. But the day came when the blisters were gone. 
and I had hands like iron. I mean, they were the blisters peeled away. And these hands, police would stop me and say, you can't walk around with them hands. Put them in your pocket. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad. But these hands were hard. Deep inside. Now listen. The blisters turned to calluses. And God, deep inside, God's rescue operation was taking place. Nature was giving me tougher, stronger hands so that I could do the job without pain. The more I afflicted them, the stronger they became. The thing about life, church, is the process. We have a tendency to spend our lifetime messing up our lives. We come to, to God say, I want you to save me. God save me. And we expect him to fix in five minutes what we've spent the rest of our life messing up. We forget that God has a process. Everybody's wanting instant victory, instant delivery, instant power. There is a process to what God does. Now, God can do it instantly if he chooses to do it. But the more radical, here's the process. The more radical, the pain. The more severe, the hurt. The more drastic that you are afflicted, then the stronger, more powerful the recovery will be. If God built into your body a recovery system that would turn blisters into calluses, don't you think he would build a recovery system into your heart? That if it's broken, there is a recovery system that's at work. If you have a, a broken spirit, there is a recovery system that God has put in operation. There's a recovery system for your mind, your emotions. The greater the problem, the greater the recovery. So whatever is going on in your life right now, the pain, the problem, the hurt, the disappointment, recovery is on the way. And when recovery comes, you will be stronger, not weaker, after it's over. Way down inside, God is beginning to build the building blocks so that you can bounce back and be stronger at the end than you were at the beginning. Now, you may not at the time, you may not see it. You may not feel it. All you can see when you're in the midst of it is the blisters. You can see and feel the hurt, the pain. But God is working. Here, now listen. Whatever you're going through right now, don't you give up. Recovery's on the way. Victory's on the way. Overcoming is on the way. Healing is on the way. Don't you give up. Now, you, it, here's the danger, another danger. You can use your problem as an excuse for failure. Or you can use it, your affliction, your problem, as a means to help and encourage others. Jesus told Simon Peter, said, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Do you know what that means? Wheat has a husk on it. They would gather the wheat, take it to the thrashing floor, and they would beat it, stomp it, carry it on to get all of the husk loosened up. And then the women would take winnowing baskets, these big baskets. 
They weren't very deep, but they were big. And they would take this wheat and they'd shake it. And then when the, as the wind was blowing, they would throw it up in the air. The wind would blow all the husk away. And the grain would fall back into this winnowing basket. He said, Satan has desired, Simon. He's going to throw you into a whirlwind. He's going to throw you into a tornado. And you are going to be turned upside down, sideways, and every way but loose. But when you are restored, remember to use what has happened to you to encourage your brethren who are going through the same thing. You can use as an excuse, and this is such a tragedy of what's happening in so many people's lives today. Every one of us has had problems. Every one of us has had afflictions. Every one of us has had reason to quit. But the fact is, many people just give up today because they've gone through some problems and they weren't sure how to handle them. Victory does not come when you're on the mountaintop. Victory comes when your face is in the mud. The devil's got his boot on your neck and his whip on your back. Victory comes in the slave pits of Egypt. Victory comes with problems and afflictions. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, the stronger they became. Victory is born in moments of fear, doubt, pain, hurt, discouragement, misunderstanding, lies. If you're down and you're hurt, you're flat of your back, and the world's counting you out saying, you're finished. It's over. There's nothing you can do now. It's all over. You may as well quit. I'll tell you what, if that's where you are right now, drink deep from that pain. Drink deep because in the midst of that affliction, that's where decisions are made to never give up. Decisions are made to fight back. Decisions are made. I will not quit. You can't destroy me and I will not destroy myself. I know these afflictions are a process that I'm going through and when I get through it, I'm going to be stronger tomorrow than I was yesterday. Today, what I see happening in the church world, God is forging His church, a people who have been through the fire, they've been through the test, they've been through the problem, and they refuse to quit, to give up. Just hang in there because the greater the problem, the greater the affliction, the greater the recovery, and the greater the victory. And the stronger you become, all of the chaff is being knocked off of the wheat. God is preparing his people for what's ahead. Affliction, problems are always temporary, a temporary experience. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth them out of them all. And I know some of you are thinking, well, Mac, that's great for the righteous. But what about us poor sinners out here? Righteous does not mean that you're perfect. Righteousness does not mean that you never make a mistake. In, uh, righteousness means right standing with God. In the Old Testament, how did you get to be in right standing with God? You brought a sacrifice. You presented it to the priest. He offered it on, as, on the altar as a sacrifice for your sin. When you walked away, you knew you were in right standing with God. 
You presented the sacrifice. In the New Testament, right standing righteousness comes to those who accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of all sin. Past, present, and future. And when you come to him, he says, if we confess our sin, that's presenting yourself. I confess I've sinned. Forgive me. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He puts you in right standing with God. Now, many are the afflictions of the righteous. I don't know all the problems that are here today. I don't know all the problems of those that are listening on live streaming or television or what. But I do know there's a lot of people hurting. There's a lot of people that just seem like they have taken blow after blow after blow and it's just knocked the breath out of them. And some of you have been there. Some of you may be there now. But if you're afflicted right now and your face is in the mud and someone or something has its foot on your neck, if it hurts, if the misery and the pain, the suffering, if you're hurting now and they're laughing at you, turn up the volume. Turn up the volume. Listen to the laughter. Listen to what's going on in the background because the louder they laugh, the greater the affliction. The more it hurts, the stronger you become and the stronger the recovery. I've had people tell me I was finished several times in my life, but Max back. He just keeps coming back. If you forget everything else that I've said today, I want you to remember this. Your problems are temporary, but you are eternal. I want to say it again. Your problems are temporary, but you are eternal. Awesome. Do you realize you can look at the mountains? Look at the mighty Rocky Mountains, the Blue Ridge, the Smokies, the Ozarks, Adirondacks. Look at the mountains. You can stand in the sand and look at the oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific. You can look at the sun and the moon and you can stand there and smile and say, long before you existed, God chose me and long after you're gone I will live on because you are temporary but I am eternal the sun will one day they tell me it's going to take about 400 billion years but it will burn out there will be no sun Peter the apostle said that the earth would melt with a fervent heat. It will dissolve into nothingness. But while that's happening, you will live on because you are eternal. We gauge everything in this short span of life that we live here in this envelope called time. But beyond that is an eternal existence. You are eternal. Don't let some problem, don't let some affliction, some hurt, some pain, some disappointment, some discouragement, don't let some fleeting second, temporary second of your eternal existence destroy you. Whatever is going on, go through it. And it'll make you stronger. That's the process. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Why did he say that? 
Listen to what Jesus, what it says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. For the joy, listen, whatever you're going through right now, look to Jesus. There is joy ahead if you refuse to let your problem destroy you. He endured the cross. They crucified him. He was dead. They crucified him, drove a spear into his side. He was dead. They placed him in a tomb, sealed it with a stone, and put Roman soldiers to guard the tomb. He was dead. Do you understand that? He was dead. The disciples were depressed. They were discouraged. They had forsaken all and put all of their hope in Jesus, and now he's dead? They counted on him to be the Messiah that would bring deliverance now. But now he's dead. What are we going to do? You talk about depression. You talk about affliction. You talk about not knowing what to do. So while they're depressed, the devil and all the demons of hell are celebrating. It's finished. The battle is over. We've won. He's dead. We'll hear no more from this Son of God. We won. After three days, God said, I've had enough of this. You may have counted him out, but I haven't started counting yet. And then he starts counting. And God says, ten, nine, eight, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And the Holy Ghost entered into that tomb. And up from the grave, he arose. He descended into hell took captivity captive and took the keys of death and hell from Satan and said, you cannot hold my people anymore. That's why he endured the cross and despised the shame. If God can bring Jesus back from the dead, he can bring you back from sickness. He can bring you back from hurt. He can bring you back from lies, disappointment. He can bring you back from divorce. He can bring you back from a broken heart. He can bring you back from bankruptcy. Well, I, don't, I don't need to go on. He can bring you back. If he can bring Jesus back from the dead, he can bring you back from anything. Whatever you're going through, endure it. Endure it. Don't you quit. Whatever you're going through, the pain, the suffering, whatever trials, tribulations, afflictions, it's for a purpose. It's to make you strong enough to take the promised land.